Back in 2004, Burt Rutan and Scaled Composites made the first commercial private astronaut. In 2020, SpaceX put the first private astronauts into orbit around the Earth. And just a few days ago, uh, Firefly put uh, Blue Ghost on the surface of the moon, the first time a private company has ever landed on another world and ain't life grand. Hi, everybody. I'm Bill Little here with Steve Green and Scott Ott. Uh, gentlemen, just a kind of a, a, a quick little show for this one, because... Uh, as a person who did the, the, the series Apollo 11, what we saw and so on, there was an awful lot that was satisfying about watching um, the first successful private landing on the moon. Um, Scott, the thing that impressed me the most and, and, and something that I plan to wield as a, as a cudgel at every opportunity I, I, I possibly get was I was struck by how not only similar but how identical – the footage of watching this 21st century lander in, in the year 2025 landing on the moon, I was struck at how precisely correct um, those those special effects genius who faked the moon landing back in 1969 got the footage. I mean, it's it's it, 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 if you take away the resolution increase, it's pretty much perfect. Well, I think, you know, that studio has sat empty all these years where they shot yeah. the original moon landing. And so they needed to get some income coming into the nonprofit organization that owns it. Uh, yeah, it's it's amazing how similar they looked. Uh, you give the camera quality a bit of a bump. Uh, but uh, this this is such an exciting moment. And honestly, I think that the the losers who are still arguing about whether the original moon landings ever happened and whether or not uh, men drove car, a car around on the surface of the moon. Now, those people deserve a, a, a just a hearty bless your heart from America. Bless your heart. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and we need to celebrate with the mostly young people who made this blue ghost lander and who had to, you know, I don't think we understand how complicated this is. In Detroit, for example, back in the old days when all cars were made in Detroit, in Detroit, when you make a car, you can actually take the prototype of it out to the track and run it around in circles and see how it holds up and stuff like this. And so you can test it in real time. You go, oh, well, I guess the suspension system is not going to corner very well. We need to beef that up or whatever. You find out what's wrong with it. When you're designing a lunar lander, you can't really test it. I mean, you can run tests on it, but you can't actually put it in the, uh, I was going to say real world, but you can't put it in real lunar situations and see how it's going to perform in that particular kind of very, very thin atmosphere, in that particular kind of regolith, the soil that the pads meet when they hit the surface of the moon. All of this, all you have to go on is the previous experience of NASA, and I'm sure they heavily read all the accounts of that and watched all the videos and got everything they could, but you, you have to basically imagine it. And that's, right. I think, the magic of this generation of space explorers, these private space explorers, is they combine engineering know-how with vibrant imaginations, in many cases fueled by sci-fi novels they read as kids, and they have achieved a phenomenal first step in what is eventually going to be colonization of the moon and using the moon as a platform for further exploration out into space. And the single most impressive ingredient on the Blue Ghost Lander is the fact that it was private money. Yeah. That's the that's the ingredient that that uh, that I'm interested in, um, Steve. If uh, unless I heard incorrectly, there's another one in orbit around the moon now, getting ready to uh, make a, a landing it's, attempt. It's on its way. Yeah, it, uh, it's a Japanese lander. I can't remember the name of it. I, I apologize because is it? The, I thought these, it was a private American company. Is this another? No, it's, it's, isn't this the IM two, Steve? The it is. is Okay. Oh, that one. It's, oh, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. the first one. Okay. The there first one burned down, one fell over, went and went up into the with swamp. Blue Ghost, but it's on a much longer trip to the moon, and it won't get there for another month or two. I can't remember how long now. But is that Japanese one privately owned? I believe. I think so. it's. Pri uh, well, then great, even better. I so, Steve, remember. here's here's your question. Um, we had the first landing attempt that uh, landed on the uh, on the moon. Like I said, burned down, fell over, and, and fell into the swamp. But it, it landed <laughs> on the moon. Um, uh, we've we've a achieved a success, full success with um, with the Blue Ghost Lander. Uh, at least one, maybe two more are on the way. And you know what makes me happiest about these three uh, uh, private um, moon landing uh, vehicles is is that none of them are SpaceX. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, no, that's huge. We So Elon Musk's reason for wanting to get us onto Mars is he doesn't want all of humanity's eggs in one basket, this beautiful 
right. blue marble earth because what what happens if we screw it up or something happens and you don't want to put all of your your launch eggs in one company's basket spacex so i'm as much as i complain about uh, companies like ula or blue origin i'm still cheering for them to succeed right because we can't just rely on spacex and actually this goes into something that i i noticed yesterday i had a conversation with grok about this because i was marveling not just at the achievement of, of getting this privately owned and built lander blue ghost to to perform and perform flawlessly. Oh my God. But I thought about the, the money, the technical talent, the, the physical infrastructure, the rocket it took to get that one little lander on the moon. And I started thinking, you know, our ambitions are much bigger than this. We want to establish a permanent base on the moon. Elon Musk wants a city of a million people on Mars, big enough to be self-sustaining. And so I had this conversation with Grok about the logistics, and um, I don't know if people are aware of this, but the reason why Starship is so important is its ability to take a lot of stuff anywhere in the inner solar system. I mean, a lot of stuff, unprecedented amounts of stuff anywhere. And the reason it's possible, or I should say will become possible, is orbital refueling, because usually whatever you can carry up to orbit, that's all you get in terms of thrust. And what Starship does is change that with orbital refueling. You get the Starship up there, you top off the tank, and now, boom, you can go anywhere with a lot more stuff than ever before. You, you look at Saturn V and, and Apollo, and and the, the part devoted to the crew of that giant that the giant command rocket, modules, it's, yeah, just, it's, almost, it's almost indistinguishable on the rocket, yeah. Yes, and that's that's what went to the moon. And Starship changes that or is going to change that. And so I had this conversation conversation with Grok. What does it actually take to, to get a Starship to the moon? So, well, NASA says it's probably going to take 10 additional launches of Starship tankers because each tanker can only carry so much fuel. And you're going to lose some of that fuel in transfer. Some of it's going to boil off. Some of it you just can't get out of the tank. Uh, Musk thinks that because Starship uh, flights won't be full. They won't have as much mass as they can carry. That he can probably get that down to four to six tanker flights. So sending one starship to the moon is going to require five to eleven launches. Five to eleven launches. And I asked Rock, can the can the two launch towers currently at Starbase in South Texas can can they handle that? And the answer was yes. Well, now we get to Mars, and Musk wants to launch. I in 2026, so I think it might slip to 2028, five uncrewed starships to Mars. Now, those are going to have to be fully topped off. You're talking at least 10 tanker launches per starship to Mars. So you are, you're looking at 55 launches to get to Mars with those five unmanned starships. And uh, for that, Grok estimates you're probably going to need at least 25 launch towers and all the fuel tanks and and the the space for the ground crews and all the rest. You're talking about a major development uh, in this what used to be this this town of like 12 people in South Texas. And then we get to something very interesting in terms of logistics. I realize interesting and logistics don't exactly match for a lot of people, <laughs> but it does for me. So the goal to get a million people on Mars is going to require. And again, this is according to SpaceX, approximately 1,000 starships per 60-day launch window every 26 months. Now, according to Rock, if they can get turnaround times on these tankers down to, 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 to once or, to, or twice a day, you're still going to need, depending on your assumptions, anywhere between about 180 and over 700 launch towers and all the ground crews and storage tanks and all the rest to make this possible. It's insane. The investments in, in, in the physical infrastructure, the, the ground crews that are going to have to be uh, trained, the, 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 just the intellectual work it's going to take to get this done. And yet that's the level that Elon Musk is dreaming on. And it all started... With that 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 tiny little tip of a Saturn V rocket, and now we're talking about launching a thousand of them, thousands of them, 
in the space of 60 days. Wow. Imagine that. Well, thank you for that astonishingly uh, cool breakdown of, of what SpaceX is doing. But like I said, my favorite part of this landing is that it wasn't SpaceX. Yeah. Um, and, and this is this is the point. Sorry, that I got I got derailed. No, no, no. I'm not trying. To, I'm not trying to. Uh, <laughs> uh, on the contrary, I, I'm glad you. I'm glad you went into that kind of detail, because because the entire point of this is is that the secret to opening up uh, the the final frontier is private enterprise starting. Well, you can say that Firefly didn't start exactly very small. They put the they put the first private lander on the moon. My entire point is, Firefly is probably where SpaceX was in what two thousand nine or something along those lines, or twelve or something like that. All of these companies now are springing up. SpaceX has shown that you can make a lot of money. In fact, you can make the world's richest man if you if you take the space flight vision seriously. And the beautiful thing about this and the other landers that are on the way and the ones that are in design and development and so on and so on and so on is that as we finally begin to pry space away from the government and, and put it into the private sector, people will be making decisions on whether or not this mission is worth funding with their own hard-earned money predicated upon whether or not they're going to see a return on investment. They all know they're not going to see it immediately. But they also know that the return on investment is an opening up of the economy on, on a potential scale that matches the size of the opening of the world economy when, when the Americas were discovered. Uh, so, so watching a, a, a small group of Americans, I might point out, and, and, and privately funded uh, private citizen Americans – Put a lander on the moon is a milestone that is worthy of, of recognition. The question now is how many other companies can do it? And NASA's role, in my opinion, should be to abandon the ridiculously, insanely expensive um, Artemis program. Let Elon Musk put a starship on the moon. He knows what he's doing. And, and take the money that we were spending on, on manned spaceflight through the inefficiency of the government and invest it in, in these small companies, especially in terms of prizes. The great thing about a prize yes. is if you put a $20 million prize on landing on the moon, you will get a $20 million investment and five companies will get that $20 million investment and one of them will get the prize and you get all of these different opportunities. So it was just great. I'll just close by saying that the landing footage that you see here is, uh, is very dramatic with the earth in the background. Nice round earth to, uh, to, uh, convince the people who are sure of the flat earth that the round earth is there. The dust behavior the way the dust behaved on the Apollo landings, the, the, the shutdown procedures, the, the, the final approach, all of it. Um, if this is not enough to convince you that it actually happened in 1969 and then in 70, 71, and finally 72, then um, your window of disbelief is getting smaller. Let's just put it that way. For Steve Green and Scott Ott, I'm Bill Whittle. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time right here on Right Angle.